There was an old Greek philosopher. His name was Aristippus, and he had the reputation of loving to enjoy life. And one day he went on a long trip, and because he was traveling, he took his money box with him. And while he was on the ship, he overheard the crew discussing the probability of stealing the money and tossing him overboard somewhere during the trip. Well, this kind of uh, annoyed Aristippus. So the next morning when the sun came up, the crew saw him sitting on the bowsprit of the boat, way out in front. And he had his money box with him, and he was picking out the coins one by one and dropping them into the ocean. And they said, what are you doing? He said, I think it is better that the gold shall perish for Aristippus than that Aristippus shall perish for the gold. <laughs> this, I think, is a little more pertinent than you may first imagine, dealing with the problems of today. Another ancient symbol that is very interesting and productive of thought is the old Egyptian symbol of a serpent with its tail in its mouth. Uh, this serpent, of course, is the symbol of uh, life, light, wisdom, strength, and all these things. But when the tail is in its mouth, the Egyptians tell us the snake was eating itself. It was living on its own body. And finally, it would reach the point where there was nothing left but its head and nothing else left to eat. This also is very pertinent to the moment, with problems that are existing around us every day. Now, this problemed world in which we live is responsible for a great many problems. And these problems are many of them well within the boundaries of crime. We are creating a cultural misunderstanding. We are losing sight of the essential values of life. And in so doing, we are endangering the survival of our way of life. In order to enjoy the securities that are ours by intelligent effort, we must protect ourselves against the abuse of those values without which civilization must collapse. Today we have a number of serious difficulties on our hands, one of the most pressing being the problem of narcotics. This particular issue has a great many different aspects, and I want to try to cover a few of them uh, this morning. The use of narcotics goes back a very long way into antiquity. But for the most part, in ancient times, it was associated with religion. Also in those ancient times, which are perpetuated in some of the American Indian communities of today, where certain narcotic drugs are used in religious rituals, there seems to have been very, very little problem. There is no indication that these usages in antiquity resulted in a popular addiction which d damaged or endangered the whole structure of civilization. One of the reasons was that the person or the persons using these drugs must realize that he is part of the chemistry of the consequences. In other words, if as in primitive times, an individual had very few ulterior motives, was largely given to a strong religious conviction, and was doing his best to be a proper citizen, or was under a discipline of social laws sufficient to keep him straight, under those conditions, there were very few dangerous hallucinations. The person himself was not confused in his normal state. Therefore, confusion did not become aggravated by the use of drugs. In the oracles and so forth, only those who were of pure mind and pure heart were permitted to give oracles induced by volcanic fumes or any other medium. If an individual was corrupt, any use of that would stimulate the de development of attitudes was considered to be dangerous and was prohibited. So what we are suffering from, in part at least, is the subconscious being released and bearing into the objective 
a mass of confusion, discord, dissatisfaction, disillusionment, and frustration. The moment this gate is open, Pandora's box has the lid lifted, and out of it comes every kind of tension, stress, and misuse which has been chemically or alchemically caused within the person himself. If he is dissatisfied, aggravated, disillusioned, disappointed, all of these things become consciously projected upon his outward personal conduct. He, he becomes the personification of the grudges which he has developed. He becomes the personification of the social usages which he objects to. And he is also seeking a kind of negative deliverance from the contemplation of his own problems. Wherever we find this addiction developing, we find disillusioned persons. Now, why are they disillusioned? Well, many people believe that there are ways of being happy. And when these ways fail, this is a serious disillusionment. Among the disillusionments of today, is that of wealth. The individual, determined by the psychology of his environment, to struggle for the accumulation of a large fortune, then suddenly finds himself in a condition in which this is not helping him, but is providing him with the funds to get into further trouble. He is not able to use the things which he has. There was a farmer in Rome who dug up a pot of gold, and uh, he didn't know what to do with it, so he wrote a, a note to Caesar. And he said, Caesar, I found a pot of gold. What shall I do with it? Caesar wrote back two words, use it. The man wrote back again to Caesar and said, I don't know how to use it. Then this time Caesar wrote back three words, then abuse it. And this is exactly what happens in sober fact. When we don't know how to use what we have, we begin to use it mistakenly, trying desperately out of wealth to achieve happiness, to achieve a personal sense of security. Now, in order to have a sense of security and purpose, we have to be doing something worthwhile. We must have ideals. We must have convictions. We must have projects that are meaningful to society. Where there is no project beyond the satisfaction of personal attitudes, nearly anything that we have will be abused. And we will suffer from the negative mistake that assumes that the more we have, the happier we will be. The truth is, the more we have, the more we will abuse what we have unless we know how to use it rightly. Actually, therefore, a large part of our narcotic problem is a byproduct of the social situation in which we find ourselves today. There is no doubt in the world that it is also a case, again, of the snake devouring its tail, because society is producing antisocial forces which are hard at work to use society to destroy itself. This type of problem is well represented in the peddler of cocaine, heroin, and marijuana. These people are perfectly willing to sacrifice the survival of a way of life in order to make a few fast dollars. Wealth has become, again, a very important factor in our way of life. And as long as wealth is the major consideration in personal conduct, we're going to be in exactly the condition we're in now, and probably it will get worse. The idea that the reward for effort is to be paid in terms of money, or in terms of public acclaim, or in terms of uh, control of other persons' lives, as long as these are our motives, we're in trouble. These are a kind of madness in themselves, and the good book tells us that whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. There is madness in the air, and this madness is a, a problem that we all have to face. 
But there's one thing we can remember, and we should remember, and should work with it in every way that we can, namely, that our own individual security is in our own hands. We cannot be destroyed by temptation unless we are tempted. We cannot get into trouble unless we set the causes of trouble in motion in our own lives. We cannot be completely disillusioned unless we have done things that were not very right and they have disappointed us. The individual is not in any real emergency as long as he stays sober, thinks straight, and does all that he can to deepen his understanding of the official and natural principles of life. We live in a world that can take care of us beautifully. We live on a planet that has much to bestow. But if we go to work gradually and relentlessly to destroy our own resources, whether they be social, geographical, or psychological, if we keep on destroying them, wasting them, perverting them, we can get this old planet which is such a will, willing and wonderful servant into a very desperate situation. We have to begin to take some kind of serious thought on the problems that confront us. A new generation growing up today is really in serious trouble. It is growing up in a world that has lost the name of conduct and tradition. It is no longer controlled by anything except personal ambitions, dissatisfactions, and various forms of anarchy. The individual growing up has much to tell us that we should listen to. First of all, somewhere along the line, he may turn and say, if I had had a different education, I might have done better. With an entirely inadequate schooling, I am thrown into chaos. Instead of being given the skills within self to estimate values and refrain from unfortunate involvements, the ch young person is in trouble. He is in trouble because of example. The older generation is not developing his integrities. Those situations which he finds in life are compromised on every hand for profit. He finds himself in a world of ulterior motives. And if there is any basic integrity in him, he is pretty well sickened by the whole situation. He also discovers that all the institutions to which he might turn for guidance and in integrities have themselves been more or less discredited. We find that the average institution does not have any moral program to protect those who belong to it, work for it, or cooperate with it. There is a world, therefore, in which young people are at a serious disadvantage. Their personal lives are inadequate. Many of them are from broken homes. A great many of them have a bad hereditary background. And they have had practically no inducement to unfold the latent potentials of themselves. Many of them are not even aware that the mind is for anything except for the gratification of appetites. With this type of a world to live in, it is quite understandable why an escape mechanism suddenly becomes highly desirable to their thinking. An escape mechanism simply based upon the idea of have fun this minute. Do what you want to right now. If you want to feel ten feet tall right now, do so. If you want to rise above all the problems of society, hypnotize yourself into the sense of your own greatness. This, has been, this is accomplished in various ways through drug abuses. It causes the individual to temporarily lose sight of his own integrities. They are already submerged where he can hardly find them, but he makes certain that he has a surface life which will last a few years. How a generation of people 
growing up in a land with the privileges and opportunities that we have here can go consciously and intelligently into the gentle process of destroying themselves, knowing by evidence, proof beyond doubt, that as a result of drug addiction, they are going to ruin their own lives in a few years and will probably die unpleasantly. If this doesn't mean anything, then it would seem to imply that to many of these young people, death by drug addiction is better than life without it. This is an indictment of civilization. And it is an indictment of a pattern which with which we hope to build a future. We hope to be able to prove that our way of life, a way of freedom, democracy, and uh, cooperation can lead the rest of the world somewhere. But with the present pattern, we have lost our own fitting, uh, footings almost completely. We are not in a position to lead anyone anywhere. Our religious institutions which might have considerable influence in this matter, are more or less eliminated by the modern materialistic youth, which is not much concerned with these matters until misery sets in, and then it is usually too late. Our education is failing. The distribution of values is failing. The power to make a decent living by effort and ethics, these, this is failing and the individual finds himself in a world which is not worth living in as far as values are concerned. He finds himself in a very difficult and uh, miserable condition. When we take this person to a psychiatrist and get him under psychiatric care, it is necessary, if possible, to gradually work him through a whole mass of complexes and a great number of fixations of his own mind, including delusions, work him through again to a sense of normalcy. In some mysterious way, the Aegean state stable has to be cleansed. We have to give the mind, the brain itself, a house cleaning to get rid of the false opinions, the desperate attitudes, the disillusioned convictions of most people today. So the psychiatrist settles down to an extensive procedure, which may or may not be successful, but will certainly be expensive. <laughs> Instead of that, what ha is happening? We are opening, by means of narcotics, this whole background of psychological mayhem within the individual by a reduction of conscious control of attitudes. Under the influence of drugs, the door opens, and every misery, every adversity, every pressure, every frustration comes out with a torrent of pressures behind it. And these pressures coming out without anything to control them lead to excesses uh, from which very few young people can survive. Now, the problem of the entire process is what happens what happens in connection with, for instance, cocaine? How does it affect? The best way we can approach it at the moment is to recognize that this effect is largely the result of magnetic fields and their interplays. If we had the instruments by which we could make the necessary adjustments, and maybe we will have some of them, we will discover that narcotics and like all other plant or mineral products, are alive. They have vibratory rates. They have their own magnetic fields. They are not simply what you can see and taste. Behind everything that we know is a vibratory rate. And this vibratory rate is the problem with which we are most concerned. We know also that in the human body, there are various polarities over which uh, nature uh, has been able to, or through which nature has been able to control the conduct. The human mind and the emotional focuses 
are locked behind a pattern of laws and are filtered through the mind as a result of experience, morality, ethics, conviction, education, opportunity, and racial and national traditions. The mind is a guardian of the subconscious. The mind helps the individual to prevent the pressures from within from going out and destroying him all the pressures on the outside getting in and destroying him. The mind is a kind of coordinating filter by means of which everything is reduced to usable levels of process. Excesses of one kind or another do not occur unless there is an abuse or misuse of energy. Now the center of most of our problem for in this particular case will probably be the endocrine system. We will define probably that the pineal gland is the center by which moderation and coordination is possible in the physical body. It is a controlling factor, not only physically, but metaphysically. The pineal gland is a structure by means of which the magnetic fields of the whole body are regulated. Every organ has an integration in itself. The stomach is an entity. The ancients realized this. We don't. We know, however, that if we treat the stomach badly enough, it is going to come back at us. It is not going to accept abuse without resistance. If, however, we pay no attention to a reasonable request for reformation, then the various organs and glands and so forth settle down to suffer, deteriorate, and finally lose control of the functions which they are supposed to regulate. It seems very likely at the present time that the individual using certain narcotic drugs is breaking down the protective structure between the inside and the outside of himself. He is passing gradually from a real and existing thing into a kind of dream world, mostly nightmares. He finds himself in a, in a vista or a, a rate of vibration which normally he is protected against. It is this same rate by around which nearly all the traditions of magic were built. It is this mysterious rate of energy that is the controlling factor in determining right and wrong in conduct. It is also a door leading into the invisible realms which are populated also by rates of energy, rates of vibration, which are received into the human consciousness very often as beings or entities. Here we have, therefore, a person who is not able to adjust in this world suddenly being confronted with a series of phantoms, phantoms which are phantasms of his own brain miscalculations, the door leading in to the subconscious being opened, a mass of miseries come out. Uh, one simple example I remember that came into my particular observation was a young man who had a very interesting but tragic life. He belonged to a minority racial group and from birth and childhood he had felt the oppression of the popular opinion against the people with whom he was related. He was hurt, damaged, antagonized, frustrated, and finally became actively rebellious. With the power of uh, economic need and with the profession for which he had been educated, he was able to keep this particular problem rather under control. He worked out some of it through dream symbolism. He worked out some of it through psychological counseling. And he worked out some more of it by being busy doing things that took his energies and gave him a certain sense of fulfillment. Somewhere along the line, this individual suddenly developed an addiction uh, to alcohol, which is, of course, not by any means as excessive usually 
as some other addictions. But within three months, this man was destroyed. The moment he lost the control of his own conscious mind, every misery, every persecution, every bit of misfortune that went back for generations in his family surged out, and he actually committed crime. He would never have committed crime had the pressure within himself had not been so intense and the defenses against it had been gradually removed by alcohol. Therefore, any individual who is not happy in a normal state will be more unhappy under the addiction of any form of stimulant which breaks down the defenses of the conscious character of the person. Nearly everyone is born with a dual nature. He is born with the instrument by which he can adjust to society and by which he gradually converts himself to a reasonable way of life. In order to accomplish this, however, you have hereditary factors, you also have early environmental conditionings, and you have the larger environment of social existence. Where the person grows up in a comparatively secure atmosphere, he has not too much danger of any serious uh, drug habit. But where he has not had any fixation of character, he's had no structural support, the situation gets worse and worse. We have passed through in the last century, in the present century, we have passed through two world wars, great depressions, and we're in the midst of complete planetary upheaval. This should, have, should be the great challenge. To meet this, every individual should be using the very best mental equipment that he has. He should be thinking seriously on the ways in which he can think straight in a crooked situation how he can survive all of these difficulties simply because he has resources within himself that are stronger than the pressures on the outside. Today, the average young person does not have these resources, and older persons in various walks of life also lack these resources. It is not to today very good or easy to find the type of life that would contribute to security. If we go into, for instance, our entertainment world, we find that the entire programs of television, stage, theater, all these elements are completely corrupted. They are broken down into the gratification of the very miseries with which we are trying to protect ourselves against. We are in the place of a series of phantoms, illusions, dream images, imaginary stories, all kinds of psychological pressures that exist for only one reason, namely to make money. We are supposed to have these because a larger audience watches them. And a larger audience watches them because more people are sick than are well. <laughs> Therefore, the individual who is in the midst of a frustrational mess himself uh, can identify with misery, but cannot identify with growth, progress, and harmony. Actually, the entire situation is closing in because of the incredible stupidity, stupidity of people. It is due to the fact that with all our thinking and with all our planning, our great dream in life is to live in a peaceful world, happy and well-adjusted, without sacrificing any ambition, any selfishness, or any misuse of energy or waste of time. We are supposed to be able to perfect the world as it is, keeping all of the factors that we enjoy as amusement or for profit and at the same time live noble and exalted careers. It just cannot be done. And we are going to face it more and more as time goes on. Now, the factor of karma plays an important part also in this situation. Karma is individual, and it is also collective. 
Karma can be a long-range procedure in which the individual brings with him into embodiment the debts unpaid in time past. It also can lead into the future so that present action may have its ultimate conclusion far beyond the present day. Now, we may assume, and most people must assume, that the, the karma which we have brought with us into life is a mixed blessing. This doesn't mean that none of it is good. There are many wonderful things that we bring with us. In fact, nearly everyone is born with an idealism of some kind. He is not born without it, but it is taken away from him in his formative growth years. He comes into, the li into this world to enjoy the wonders of life. As a small child, he sees around him only wonders and mysteries. But if the family is close, his childhood is happy. But the average family is not close. And this is partly due to economic situation in which the child's misery results from the necessity of the parents to take care of the economic conditions. On the other hand, this is also often abused, in which the parents take on extravagances and personal pleasures beyond their means and then blame that for the uh, fact that they cannot take care of their families. So into this world, the individual comes with karma. But he nearly always comes with a great deal of potential. One of the terrible tragedies of the modern world is that most persons are born and die without releasing the internal potential with which they were supposed to build a life. Instead of releasing potential, they are simply smothered by outside pressures. Actually, society is a little better than we think it is. There are a great many very good people. There are a great many good homes. There are a great number of honest persons and still many more who would be honest if they knew how to accomplish this. Therefore, we have with us a strong potential. We have great possibilities, but we also have the unfinished business of our own lives. The moment the individual reaches uh, five or ten years of age, character is clearly indicated. People have their own individual ways of life. These ways may or may not resemble the ways of their parents in any way. They come with talents, abilities, concepts, attitudes, dispositions. These must be trained, developed, organized, and worked with but no one seems to have the time to do it. And by the time they get around to it, because the child has become a delinquent, it is too late to accomplish the necessary corrections. But the use of what we bring into life is tremendously important. It is quite obvious, I think, that most persons coming into life do not primarily desire to be rich or famous. The rich fame complex comes a little later when it becomes obvious to them that wealth and distinction bring, certain, bring with them certain advantages, certain fulfillments otherwise difficult. But in most cases, the greater the wealth, the less the likelihood of the inner life being developed or sustained. Because as wealth increases, interests change from the improvement of character to the accumulation of possessions. But actually, each individual is a potential helper in the perfection of civilization. Every good thing that the world has today came from within some human being who brought it forth as music, as art, as literature, as drama, as history, all kinds of wonderful developments, discoveries, and experiments have been carried on by human beings, many of them for the advancement and benefit of society. Therefore, each person has something to give. But if he can't give it, and it is locked within himself, a certain tension develops, a stress, a frustration. The individual who has always wanted, as long as he can remember back, has always wanted to go to sea in a ship, finds himself locked in a broker's office. An individual whom nature has intended to be an artist 
ends up as a doctor because there's more money in it. Little by little, the physical advantages take shape against natural integrities and natural interests. The individual, not being able to do what he wants to do, sits uneasily in his body for the rest of his life. He is never quite adjusted because he has never fulfilled himself and has substituted false fulfillments for the impulses and instincts that he brought with him. Not being truly adjusted to the profession he may accept, he will not be a great success even in that. And not being a success in anything, he finds it becomes a great fatiguing factor. Out of this comes a common occurrence which we all have a tendency to notice and that is the desperate interest with which we look forward to retirement. We believe that when retirement comes, we can get out of the job we never wanted to be in. <laughs> but how could we help ourselves with children to educate, with parents to protect, with grandchildren to bless, and all kinds of responsibilities of government, taxation, and uh, economic stress? Therefore, at 65, we assume that we are going to have release. Another way in which we get the assumption is when we get the first million. If we get the first million, we're sure then we can live as we want to. And then the pressures start and are much worse than they were before. So that nothing seems to work out. The individual who doesn't do what he wants to do is in trouble. The individual who sacrifices his ideals for profit is in trouble, and both look forward to retirement. So they retire at 65 so they can live their own lives. And what have they got? Nothing. They have no life. Certainly they don't want to go on with the professions that they didn't like while they were working with them. They have no other vital interests. So they settle down to the quiet contemplation of impossible television. <laughs> or they go someplace and try to do a little charity work as a sort of soul repentance for a life of self-centeredness. Many of these people are good people. But again, the ability to release from within has been destroyed. Now, when you start releasing from within, however, you do run against problems. You run against the fact that these releases must be natural, gentle, and suitable to our need. We cannot afford to have karma dumped on us too fast either, because we may not be able to carry it. Karma considers, consists primarily of unfinished business. And for the average human business, of human being, unfinished business is character building. It is the process of growing. And this is something that is not finished and we may not even maintain during the one lifetime that we are here now. So therefore, when this kind of situation develops, we find that it is best to have this karma move in on us with a certain amount of pattern which we can react to by which we can learn something, by which we can accept a lesson as being valuable to us. But if under tremendous mental or emotional pressure, a comic load is discharged too rapidly, the individual simply becomes sick. And the sickness is usually in the form of some kind of mental emotional activism, an antisocial reaction a reaction of destruction, pressure, and tension. Now, everyone is capable of a bad disposition, but a great many people have learned not to have it because they've done something about it. Now, if we take a person who has a bad so-called daily existence and we take this person into retirement, we're going to find that this bad disposition begins to move and work then we will find the lack of proper activity, mental and emotional, results in what might be termed senility. Where there's nothing inside, the individual simply weakens. Where there is something inside that is bad, the older person becomes more difficult. 
where if, if there is something inside that is good and the mind is no longer interfering, then the individual is a pleasant in person and may have a rather quiet, enjoyable uh, old age. All these things relate to the development and release of the psychic potential of the person. Actually, therefore, we have to begin to recognize that the individual who goes out and gets drunk for the first time is telling us a story of a pattern, a fulfillment sought in the wrong way, an inability to cope with self, and a desperate effort to escape self, to forget that we exist, to pass finally into a kind of a genteel coma. But on the way to this coma, something happens. The individual, partly intoxicated, may become violent, may attack his family, may become a criminal, may do all kinds of disreputable things which he would never do if he were sober. And that release of the so-called negative side of life, when the pressure of the public opinion is removed, the half-drunk person, is very much likely to be similar in many ways to the individual under narcotics. The half-intoxicated person is unable to control his own drinking and has a series of delusions, probably including delirium tremens. And the drug addict also passes through all kinds of moods some of them over-exhilarated, some of them definitely destructive. The individual, having lost control of himself, falls back on what the Buddhists call the not-self, the illusion, the delusion which most people believe to be themselves. Actually, consequently, they must recognize that the narcotics problem is aggravated and made worldwide because of economic factors. And thousands, millions of people are dealing in narcotics perfectly aware of the fact that they are destroying human life. And they're perfectly willing to destroy life for the sake of money. And quite willing, finally, to steal and commit a whole variety of crimes in order to get the price of narcotics. All this is adding to practically every crime of society. But there is no one who has to become a narcotic addict. No one has to try it the first time. No one has to continue to use it. Fully aware when they do continue to use it that they are wrecking themselves. This is largely due to a search inside of the person to find out why he should live. He's also probably tried to answer that question himself, but he cannot find with any, within himself any reason to change his ways. He cannot see what he would be any better off if he did not become an addict, because the world as it is around him is as delusional, dangerous, and dis discouraging as anything that could possibly result from his intemperances. He therefore ends up with the idea of a short life and a bright one. But even this fails, because very few narcotic addicts ever get out of this world without great misery. So all problems go back again uh, to what we might call a comic situation. Every impulse within the person to a negative or destructive action is the pressure of a mistake or a blind spot or a corruption not corrected within himself. The individual who cannot withstand the pressures of temptation has not withstood them in the past, therefore has pay paid many times and is now paying again, but is given an opportunity this time to correct his own faults faults that we allow to become apparent to our conscious thinking are here because they are offering an opportunity for the correction of themselves. We are not here to humor our faults, we are here to overcome them. Every fault overcome is the end of a comic pressure. 
and a comic pressure which we have brought with us may contain within it the whole sad history of the human race far, far much further back than we realize. We come into the, this world unstable, incapable of clear judgment, but we are here to gain stability and to clarify and improve judgment. It is only when we do these things that our life becomes important. Today, there are not the proper inducements, apparently, to inspire the individual to make these changes in himself. Actually, how many people really uh, respect their own lives? How many really say that their life is important to them? Uh, certainly, they do not want to leave here before their time, most of them at least, but the number of suicides is increasing dramatically because of the fact that this world as it is now is not giving the individual the incentives of survival. And what in comic terms is this. We are in an environment in which there is no inducement to improve ourselves. There are inducements to be more wealthy, there are inducements to physical pleasures or excesses, but in terms of growth, there are very few inducements for the individual to be a better person tomorrow than he is today. All the inducements are clouded. All the indulgences stand out as possible temporary solutions to problems for which a real solution is not available. So this world as it is, is a great inducement to leave karma uncorrected. And one of the ways in which we can do this is to have our minds taken away from our own faults and shortcomings. Instead of saying to ourselves, let's forget the whole thing and go out and have a night on the town. It might be wiser for all concerned for the individual to say to himself, let's try to work out something here that will make life important, useful. And one way we have found in the past that many people have found to be helpful was service, to get out to help other people, to get our minds off of ourselves, to try to do the good deed as the final panacea for the ills we have already committed. Actually, we are here with all these faults, some of which we have to do uh, some thought uh, and uh, rem remedial means. We have to work them out. If we to destroy the thinking equipment, if we make it possible for the mind to lose track of values, if we obstruct and obscure the lesson factor in the things that happen to us, we just get more and more miserable and sicken and finally die. If the mind can lead, it can help. But if the mind loses the power of leadership and gives it over uh, to the uh, intensities of a drug, then the problem is out of hand. We have destroyed the rationalizing faculty in ourselves or inhibited it and impaired it. To do this means in inevitably that we become a burden upon ourselves and others. We get worse and worse unless something happens strong enough and powerful enough to bring us back again in line. But then again, there's another difficulty. Uh, if the narcotics habit extends long enough, recovery is almost impossible. The damage that has been done to the nervous system the damage that has been done to the magnetic fields of the body cannot be quickly repaired. And the person, though they may recover from the habit, will not be the person they should have been had they not developed the habit in the first place. Now, how can we try to work out this thing a little more successfully? Let's make a, try to make a little formula out of it. First of all, let us assume that every human being is here to, here to learn something. He is here to correct faults, to strengthen ideals, to gather and accumulate facts, to become wiser and better and finally happier, because there is no actual happiness apart from growth. 
Any individual who tries to be happy by evading or avoiding responsibility is making a basic mistake. Therefore, assuming that we are here to do something worthwhile, this next problem comes in, of course, is to preparing ourselves for this worthwhile activity. Normally, parents who really care for their children will do what they can to help them in this orientation. In the older days, when life was much simpler, it was customary for children to follow in the trades and professions of their elders. The shoemaker's son became a shoemaker. The sailor's son went to sea. The minister's son became a preacher. These were the common procedures of the time, and the parent constantly gave what he could of his own experience to advance the cause of his children. He tried to help them to be the persons that they could be, or at least he thinks they could be. All this made a more or less secure situation in a sense. It might have frustrated some personal ambitions, but they were not very strong at that time at best. The individual was brought up within a pattern in which education began by example and was cultivated by a family that sincerely had affection for him and was given every possible opportunity to fulfill a useful career. This was equally true of both men and women. Today, this has practically changed. There is no longer this type of thing. The apprenticeship in the family is very, very unlikely. Positions and employments of, of mature persons are impermanent, insecure, and usually unpleasant. Therefore, each has to start and build a complete career without benefit of parental guidance or parental assistance or assistance through the educational structure. So each person has to work it out for himself. Now, if he can reach a certain age, say around 20, without being completely contaminated, he has a good chance of working out something worthwhile. He can be an individual and do his thing instead of being bound into something. I uh, read in the paper not long ago that Walt Disney on one occasion told a friend that he was a, gra a grade school dropout. Disney had practically no formal education, but he did rather well because he did his thing. He did what he wanted to do. And he didn't depend upon schooling to obliterate or deform or distort his own feelings on these matters. And this is true in a great many instances. If the person can reach the time of decision in life without having this decision corrupted, he will probably be able to make an, a useful and important contribution to society. And education may help him. He may be able to give him a fuller understanding of practical ways of helping. Education may provide him with the instruments of service, which will be of value to him. But it is the instinct within himself to serve that must be preserved, or else the techniques are worse than useless, and will end again in exploitation. Having decided in some sense of the word and by some internal adjustment that the individual can be a person, an individual, uh, in a society of mass calculations and collective pressures, he can then, as far as his daily life is concerned, do whatever is necessary to meet the responsibilities of living. The individual who finds a way of avoiding responsibility is in very bad way also because this avoidance becomes habit forming and the person becomes a completely inadequate individual. But assuming that he is reasonably doing the things he is equipped to do, he can then build a life around whatever is necessary for his own growth. His job may take a certain percentage of his life but a job will not destroy his inner life if it has vitality of its own. A job that destroys the inner life is a job in which the inner life was not strong enough to survive the pressure of outward circumstances. 
But if the individual within himself has character or conscience or integrity or has ideals or perhaps certain gifts and abilities which do not fit into his economic pattern, these things can be preserved, they can be developed, and if necessary, they can become the second careers after retirement. But there's no need for the idealism in the individual to die because of the materialism of his environment. He can survive it if he has anything in, inside of himself. He has a perfect power to be a person. He has the natural inalienable right to live and die according to principles. Now, if his principles are not adequate, if he has compromised them too much, then perhaps he will find that his mistakes will cost him heavily in freedom, freedom and in advancement. But if the person is as God created him, is a natural human being, bringing into this life unfinished business, both assets and liabilities, and always equipped to meet the day if he uses the equipment, he can have a very valuable life regardless of the pressure of circumstances. Under those conditions, he will have no need for the development of any narcotic habit. He will not need to escape from frustration because he has already inwardly strengthened his inner life so that he is doing in his own character what he really wants to do. And when this happens, the probabilities of drug addiction are greatly reduced. It is also true that if the person has a fixed vision from within his own consciousness of what is proper for him, he will not need to depend upon encouragement by bottled goods. It will, he has the encouragement within his own life. He has his own way of growing. It is not necessary for him to block his memories. It is not necessary for him to refuse to express temperamental natures which are themselves constructive and reasonable. So we find that the, our narcotic problem is largely a result of too much vacuum inside of the person. Not enough basic value to meet the pressures of life. Now life is going to have suffering. It's going to have uh, problems. But these problems and these sufferings are apt to be significant whereas the sufferings of narcotic addicts have only one remedial factor, and that is to prove to the individual that he is destroying himself. I think we have another, another very interesting point to make in connection uh, with this problem uh, of getting oneself in shape of some kind and in some way. Most people today who are interested in better things in life have a realization that there are esoteric factors in the human compound. We realize, for instance, that man lives not only in the visible world, but in an invisible environment. That this invisible environment, or the etheric diffusion in which the physical matter of life uh, exists, is under the rulership of the lunar principle. And it is the principle by means of which the constant uh, vacillation of energies and emotions and thoughts uh, that these, um, this motion is uh, maintained. In this also, according to the ancients, and perhaps they were right, who knows, this borderline between the objective and the subjective is also the sphere of ghosts. It is the sphere of beings that never had existence in the physical world, for there is no plane or stratum of nature that is not inhabited. It is also a place where, according to the ancients, uh, earthbound spirits wandered about in all kinds of unpleasant conditions, where the individual who uh, has been bound to some negative situation holds on to the situation after death and does not even know that he is dead. He continues to be the possessed or obsessed being that he was in life. 
Now in this environment also we have the source of a great deal of psychic phenomena. We are beginning to recognize that we can no longer throw away the possibility of psychic phenomena. We are no longer able to say that these metaphysical situations do not exist. Day after day we get more supporting evidence that psychism is a reality. But we also get some rather unpleasant witnesses to the problem. We, found out, we find out that most of this psychism is rather detrimental to our daily life. A psychic experience which is merely an embodiment of ambition may make us feel that we are too big for ordinary labors, that we have been given a special dispensation, and then we start off on a long program of self-illusion. And this disillusionment comes later and is hard. But it is also true, beyond doubt, that the Greeks and Egyptians were partly correct, at least, when they pointed out that all forms of narcotics formed a connection between the physical body and the etheric realm in which it exists. That this was a strange realm of pressures, that these pressures could be thought forms, emotion forms, vibratory centers of energy, by which the uh, individual is as though in a great ocean filled with living creatures of its own. As long as the magnetic field is maintained, as long as the protective armament, which is then told in the Bible, the full armor of righteousness, is protected, and the individual is a reasonable person, not damaging his own psychic factors, he is in very little trouble. There is not one case in a million where a person who has lived a straight, upright, constructive life has unpleasant psychic experiences. They are reserved for persons who are already unpleasant somewhere inside themselves. And it's simply expressing its own nature. But in this psychic atmosphere of things, we know that there are all kinds of dreams and phantoms. And then these phantoms and these dreams have a tendency to make cowards of us all, uh, as in the soliloquy of Hamlet. We are in the presence of an invisible realm from which we are marvelously and wonderfully protected because we have a particular job of our own to do. We are here to make an adjustment to redeem our own world and redeem ourselves in that world. But if we, by negative means, create a negative psychism, if we break down the protecting barriers between this objective life and the strange misty realms of the great unknown, we can get into very difficult situations. And this, of course, is one of the great problems of uh, all forms of delusion through drugs. These delusions can be sometimes very frightful. The individual goes through all kinds of torments as a result of something that he doesn't understand. He has allowed himself to fall as a living creature into something that resembles the purgatorial realm of the ancients, this mysterious psychic field uh, in which the physical life exists. It is very much a mistake uh, to permit this psychic field uh, to overwhelm us or drown us. It is this, is this problem that is the same as being drowned in the ocean. If we cannot swim, we will sink. And if we are uh, maybe a good yogi, maybe we will float. But then we will not win unless we know how to protect ourselves from self-deceit protect ourselves from all kinds of psychic revelations that never work out. All kinds of damage which we imagine, but the damage is in the mind only. We surround ourselves with all kinds of mysteries and misfortunes, and the mind becomes to substance a haunted house. This problem does mean that the moment we lose psychic control of normalcy, we become, we become, become the victims of all kinds of dis delusion and disillusion. 
We lose integration, we lose orientation, we lose the power to make proper decisions, and we finally find ourselves completely trapped in the mystery of sensation itself. Well, sensation is the emotional equivalent of uh, mental psychism. Em uh, sensation is a part of the process that has been given to us to enable us to uh, function the various sensory perceptions. Sensation gives us the power not to sit on a hot stove because if we do, we will feel the burn and get up. Sensation gives us the right to sense motion, color, form, all kinds of relationships with life. It enables us to see, enables us to hear, to taste the food that we have, and to shake hands with our friend. Sensation is part of a great structure of communication processes, but it is also something that is the base of all appetites. Sensationalism is the belief fallacy, but still many times held, that some form of excitement is a solution for stupidity. That if we can get excited enough, worked up enough, and forget ourselves enough, we will be happy. This doesn't happen either, because there is always in these matters the morning after, and that is usually deadly. But sensation again, getting out of hand as a result of psychic pressures, is exaggerated and amplified by narcotics. Narcotics as, as such affect the physical nature to a degree, but the main thing is they disturb the psychic vortices by which bodily function is maintained. In other words, they disarrange all of the uh, autonomic nervous sent, uh, system. They cause the individual uh, to become sick psychically as well as mentally or emotionally. The person simply loses control of his own life. And losing his own control of himself, he gradually reaches the point where he sacrifices the right to a life which he has lost control of. He is not supposed to float around on the surface of drug addiction. Unless he does something with his own life, nature decrees that the situation will end in dissolution. Nature will not support that which continuously breaks its own rules. There are times in, in, in medical cases where certain narcotics are necessary and useful. But as a means of escaping self, they are a deadly mistake. And yet that is why most people are using them. Now we are told, for instance, that the, the peer group uh, is responsible for a considerable amount of, of uh, drug addiction. That you have to be one with the group. That you must be uh, accepted by others of your own age group. The peer group in this case is just a group of individuals supremely ignorant the peer group has nothing to offer. The individual who tries to be popular by joining this group and making the mistakes they make is destroying himself in order to maintain a passing and very temporary social relationship. The peer group the child should learn is not that important. Education should steer the young person today away from all involvements in the peer group should reveal to him definitely that this group is not a superior group. It is a group of individuals held together by mass delinquencies, by continuing wrong addictions and attitudes. Away from the peer group, the individual is much safer. In a good family life, there is great protection against the peer group groups. The, ch the church offers a, another type of t uh, peer group, which is essential and basically constructive. There are young people's activities that are clean and proper, but the young, young person must have some discrimination in order to become part of these better groups. And here the responsibility goes right straight back to the parents, because unless the parents themselves become the final peer group, acceptable to their children, honored by their children, and respected by their children. 
the child is in trouble. Actually, we are in a kind of a peculiar process of epidemical ailments. All over the world there is war. All over the world there is suffering, privation, and tyranny. All through our lives there is unemployment. There are all kinds of besetting problems. We don't know what to do with cosmic space waste. We don't even know what to do with the local sewerage. We do not know what to do with any, with any of these things because they're all closing in on us. And closing in on us while we're in a little planet which has certain limitations that are inevitable. But this should never have happened. And because it has happened, the only thing we can do is to hope that a remedy can be found. Well, as we should be working every day to conserve and simplify life, we should get over the problem that luxury can become universal. It cannot. We should be also out of the situation in which we try to live a highly competitive economic life in a planet that's too small to permit it. All these things have to be taken into consideration. These are the problems of leadership. These are the things our educators should be working with. These are the things that our leaders and our governors and our industrial potentates ought to be concerned about. We cannot get away from misfortune until we stop causing it. And as so long as we cause chaos, we're going to have narcotic addiction. There is no way of avoiding it because we have taken life and we have taken away from it those integrities and examples which are necessary to keep people honest. We are no longer in a condition to offer a human being a natural human opportunity to be a useful part of society. We are teaching him more and more not to do the things which would make him a well-adjusted citizen. We are keeping him in the, in the, under the delusion that he is part of something which probably will fall apart because no one seems to believe it will be otherwise, but that if it falls apart he must be prepared to fall with it because there are no remedies. This is absolute foolishness. There has never been a time when the remedies have not been available. And when these, these values are established, we will find that most people want to enjoy good health, happiness, and peace of mind. Actually, if we could watch psychologically or metaphysically the effects of various materials on the etheric and vital bodies, we would have something that's very close to the Paracelsian theory of medicine. We are told by Paracelsus and others of that period that food that we eat, we do not actually receive nourishment from the food per se. We receive nourishment from a vital element, invisible, that is present in all food. It is a universal life force that we try to capture and we try to transmute food into energy, which we do only because we are releasing the energy that is in the food. Now, energies in foods differ. Some foods have more of one kind of energy, more of another. And body chemistry demands a balanced ration of these different food factors. And the great proof of alchemy is not the wisdom of the ancients, but the function of our own digestive system. We are, we are transforming base metals into living principles every day of our lives. As it is with food, so it is with most other things we have. The education we get is a form of nutrition. It is not the education per se, but the energy of thought and initiative which it releases in us that is important. Here is where the alchemy takes place. Facts become truth by alchemy. The alchemy of insight, understanding, and capacity. The same is true in our emotional life. Our affections are not physically, actually, the cause of happiness. It is the higher vibrations or octaves of our feelings 
that become nutritional to enrich our lives, to enrich our, enrich our relationships, and to become the basis of proper marital uh, happiness. The same way with all of our thoughts and minds. It is the transmutation by an alchemy of understanding that lifts all things from a standpoint of dead fact to living truth. And this chemistry is going on constantly inside of ourselves. And it is this that does the good thing for us. But the wrong diet makes us sick. The wrong emotions make us unhappy. The wrong thoughts make us miserable. Therefore, if the food is wrong, it is not any good to us. And today, humanity mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and religiously is largely on a diet of junk food. It is not just the physical junk food. It is the fact that these junk foods destroy or fail to nourish the invisible energy fields with which they are involved. Having become sick with junk food, which in this case can be world propaganda, reports and rumors of war and disturbance, we do what everyone does who is sick, we try to combat the difficulty by a trip to the doctor. The doctor tells us that we need a little more vitamin, that we've got to cut down on this, that our cholesterol is too high, that our blood pressure is too high, uh, that we are not getting enough calcium, that we're not getting enough this, that, and the other thing, and we go into a great nutritional routine. Perhaps it helps. It probably does. But let us also realize that psychologically, we cannot really depend upon drugs to take care of things that belong to the invisible levels of character. We are all suffering from the junk food, a world of, of as, as it is today. The news is junk. All these things are destructive. So we go now and we try to get something like cocaine or heroin or marijuana so that we won't notice the junk food that we won't have to improve our diet because we don't really want to do that. But we do want to get rid of the unpleasant symptoms that have come from junk thought, junk emotion, junk conduct. Therefore, we try to get some kind of a panacea by means of which we will accomplish the most that can be accomplished. Namely, that ultimately we will reach a point where we won't worry at all because there will be nothing to worry with. That will then be the problem of returning to a subhuman state and uh, drifting into the inevitable end. This type of thing we don't have to do. It's perfectly possible for us to be rather intelligent creatures in one way or another if we really try hard. It's just a case of recognizing that all stimulants, alcohol, any other stimulant, is simply a substitute and a poor one for the stimulation of our own intelligence, for our own integrity, for our own wisdom and understanding and our own cheerful, useful activity in life. An enthusiastic person with a job or one who is preparing for a job he likes, who is succeeding in the daily experiences of life, has no need for involvement in any form of narcotics or alcohol. He does not need to take a chance uh, of any form of sickness arising from a bad habit. And all habits that seek to prevent the individual from thinking are bad habits. Because he is here to think. The human being, as the Hindu says, is the embodiment of manas, the mental principle. It is the purpose of the individual to perfect the functions of the intellect, to cause the intellect to ascend to a more rarefied atmosphere and become the gateway leading into the spiritual world. It is through the mind that the individual can ascend to union with his own soul, with the best part of himself. And when he diseases this by an effort to avoid or evade growth, if he tries desperately not to be better, he can succeed in that too. But the cost is very high. It is much better for the person 
to realize that by keeping the channels of the nervous system, particularly the autonomic nervous system, and the function of the ductless glands, normal, constructive, and helpful, he will have the strength and the resource to meet practically every problem of life. And any individual who doesn't want to grow isn't willing to do a little worrying and will not devote some time to self-improvement and to the service of others. Such an individual is not entitled to any of the better things of life. But he doesn't have to re react to the worst things in life. He may remain unadjusted to life. But now the temptation is to hide his inabilities from himself, to avoid contemplating his own mistakes. And then comes the narcotic addiction and the person is in really serious condition. So well, let us really then be satisfied to enjoy our own mistakes. Let's recognize them as challenge. Let's know that we're not perfect and weren't intended to be at this particular time. But we are all here with the glorious possibility of learning something, becoming better, facing our problems intelligently, and staying awake to the world's work and the world's labor, and not trying to find some kind of a pill that will put us to sleep while we're still alive. <laughs> what we do not need is to sleep while we're alive. We are here to learn, and we are here to rest. We are here to live in this world and meet its problems. If we do so, when time comes for sleep, we will rest well. And when the time comes for a larger sleep that brings with it further opportunities, we'll be ready and carry on as we should. Well, that's it.